Hello and welcome to CCOG Online, a ministry of Cairo Church of God in Cairo, Georgia. I'm Pastor Dwayne Atkinson. Got a word from the Lord. We're going to be looking at John chapter 1. And the, to me, uh, it is so uh, significant in the way that, that this gospel begins. And so I'm uh, actually kind of excited about uh, looking into that. But just before we do, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God. May it come alive in our hearts. Uh, and uh, uh, and I pray, Father, that you let, as the Bible says, let the Word of Christ dwell richly within us. And we thank you for the privilege we have uh, to share some time together in your Word, in your will, in your presence. And we thank you for helping us to grow and to know more about you and to become more like Christ in the process. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you, and uh, and we're going to be looking at John chapter one just till till we run out of time, kind of right here. Uh, when we look at John one, there's a similarity between Genesis one and John one. For the Spirit of God inspired John to build on what we read in the book of Genesis, and. In the Amplified Bible, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, that is, in the Amplified Bible, before all time was the Word, that is, Christ. And the Word was with God, and what, and the Word was God himself. I also looked at this in the Passion New Testament. And this is how the Passion New Testament translates John 1. In the very beginning, the living expression was already there, and the living expression was with God, yet fully God. If you look at this, there is something significant about this. And, and in, in the King James Version, or like the Amplified Bible, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What's significant about that is the, uh, the Greek word, the, for word, and that is in the Greek, logos. It's spelled like logos, L-O-G-O-S. This is a significant way to present Christ to people. If you look at, uh, in, in Matthew, you know, the, the birth of Jesus was on this wise. If you look at it in, in Luke chapter 2, uh, in the days of Caesar Augustus, I think it is there, or, or when Quirinius was governor, uh, 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 they went out a decree. And then you have this narrative that builds showing before the birth of Christ and after the birth of Christ. Mark, not quite so much like that. Uh, but in John, it's totally different. He uses the same exact phrase that the, the book of Genesis uses, but nonetheless, uh, the, he uses the word logos there uh, as the word. If you were to read it with a Greek word instead of the English word, word, you would it would read this way. In the beginning, logos created the heaven and the earth. Now, this is, this is a Greek word if you look at the other two sheets that are a sheet that you have there about logos. I want to share some, something important here. Uh, this is a term or a word that is translated different ways, such as word, speech, principle, or thought. I think that's why maybe the Passion New Translation translates logos as the living expression. And basically, it's the living expression of God. Uh, and and when you look at at John chapter one, and we're going to go through this, but if you look at the second page, and that there's a, a series of, of of phrases that are underlined, and this is this is the way this word is used, and in this use of logos, this Greek word, you will find a great many things about the Lord. So, uh, yeah, oh yeah, I'm sorry, it's on the back page. I have two pages, y'all have one page because it was copied from this. Now, the first thing is this, that Jesus is eternal. 
that is, in the beginning was the Word. I looked at the origins of the Greek and Roman gods. Uh, and, you know, you, you hear about them, Zeus, uh, Poseidon, if you've ever heard of the Poseidon Adventure. It, Poseidon it was a god of the ocean, basically. And in terms of Greek and Roman gods, Roman gods were, I think, first, but when, um, excuse me, Greek gods were first, but when Rome conquered the world, including Greece, they just adopted all of those. Uh, and there's, there's a great many gods that the uh, Romans and Greeks have. And I think they're called a pantheon, like a, that means like a group of gods. And when we look at Genesis 1 and, and, and John 1, we don't see a great many groups of gods where one is in charge of fertility, one's in charge of the ocean, one's in, in charge of green things growing, and, and the list goes on, okay? They're, they're, and so we look, at, we look at Christ, and this is before uh, Judaism was before uh, Greek or Roman uh, system of uh, mythological gods and goddesses. We find, first of all, that in this concept here that John is using, inspired by the Spirit of God, we find, first of all, that Jesus is eternal. This Logos, in the sight of God, in terms of Christianity, is eternal. In the beginning, was the Word. Jewish readers will understand in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. There were, there were like a, 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 no actual beginning. It was just in the timeless past. Might be a better way. Of, in the timeless past was the Word. Might be a good way of wording that. Second thing is this. That not only this, not only was Jesus eternal, but Jesus or Logos here in John 1, was with God, that is, prior to him coming to earth. And this is got from gotquestions.org. I just looked it up. What does Logos mean in the Bible? And so this was the best answer that I thought I saw. Gotquestions.org, no spaces. So that is, the word was with God. So Jesus, or this Logos here, was with God before Jesus came to earth uh, as, a, as a Jewish baby born in Bethlehem. The third thing is this. Not only was Jesus eternal, not only was Jesus with God, but Jesus is God. And the Word was God. We can say the Word is God. Logos is God. <clears throat> the fourth thing we find in John 1, is that Jesus is creator. That is, all things, the Bible says here in John 1, all things were made through him. And without him was nothing made that was made. We see Jesus as creator. I remember in one of the ministry courses or something that they, that in that course it referred to Christ as the creative agent in creation. If you look at Genesis, God just speaks and things happen. Uh, and the fifth thing is this. We find here Jesus, this Logos in John 1, is the giver of life, of spiritual life, and he gives life. In him, the Bible says, was life, and that is eternal life, as opposed to earthly physical life, which is not eternal. You have to be born again. Uh, to have eternal life. Uh, born from above, spiritually, a different way of saying that. The sixth thing is this, not only was Jesus eternal, not only was Jesus with God, not only is Jesus God, but Jesus is also creator. Jesus is the giver of life. And the most amazing thing of all is that Jesus, this Logos, who is God, he became human and and he came to live among us. That is, in John 1, 14, the word, was, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word was, was made flesh or it became flesh. So we see the difference in contrast here between uh, the Greek 
gods and goddesses and also other religions that had all these systems of gods and goddesses. And uh, I, to my knowledge, I don't think Christ or God or the Holy Spirit are ever referred to in terms of mythology uh, as opposed to the Roman and Greek system of gods and goddesses, which are like in Roman and Greek mythology, a study of, the, of myths to a certain extent. Anybody got any comments or suggestions or questions? Very good. Let's look at the Fire Bible comment. The Fire Bible, or the uh, formerly the Full Life Study Bible, which was my favorite version of that because the type was readable, actually, a large readable type. Uh, then it became Life in the Spirit Bible, not the Spirit-filled Life Bible, Life in the Spirit Bible, and that's called the Fire Bible. Amazing commentary, very sound, but there are other Bibles that also have sound and amazing commentaries as well. Uh, but in the Fire Bible, the Bible presents history in a linear way, in a line. Uh, we could call it a timeline. Uh, or, or, it goes on to say, with a definite beginning and a God-given goal. And God had a plan in creation and he will carry it out. And so we see in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was uh, with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now, and so we look at John. He begins his gospel, the proper and correct name of the, what we call the book of John is the gospel according to St. John. And, and so the gospel just means good news. It is good news to find out you won't die lost and go to hell if you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. It is good news to find that God does not leave us or forsake us. And we need to remember, that doesn't mean you won't ever feel like God has left you or forsaken you. Jesus was on the cross dying, and he, he, he asked God, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me in English? Quoting Psalm 22, I believe. And, and so we look at at this gospel, the Bible also tells us that God has spoken to us in Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 in different ways at the right time or proper time uh, the Lord speaks to us now through his son. And, and, and so we look at Jesus who said of himself that his own words were directly from God. And when we, when we think about who Jesus is, He's the one who shows us God. If you want to know what God is like, read and study the teachings and follow the example of Jesus and emulate that. You're going to know more about what God is like. He's not like the Roman and, and Greek gods that are petty, jealous, uh, have a ten, tend to get even attitude. We hear Jesus say, turn the other cheek. The Greek gods, to my knowledge, or Roman gods did not say that. And so we look at Christ as this perfect revelation and representation of, of the Father's nature and character. Nature and character, they're different from each other, but in some ways they're the same. Your nature is kind of the, what kind of person you're like. And the way it works is this. Some people are by nature very impatient. They don't like to wait for anything. They, they get stressed out if, it, if, if, if everything's not falling in place right where it is. Then you have the other kind of person that could care less. When I, I read about Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, a comedy team from the 50s, uh, that eventually Jerry Lewis was very concerned about every angle uh, camera angle, every light where it was, and he took great effort to make sure that was perfect. And that same article said Dean Martin didn't even care if they were in the cameras were in focus or not. Now the odd thing about these people is, as I point out, that somebody who wants to get married, like somebody who is impatient, somehow they just keep searching till they find somebody who could care less about the time. And uh, if that's you. Congratulations, that's your life. You've chosen, are we not happy in that? But that's 
that works out well. People can can live together like that. Now, as we, we turn pages to save time, first of all, we look at the word that is Logos or Jesus in terms of his relationship to the Father. Now, if you're a child of God, if you're a Christian, uh, your relationship to God is that he is our heavenly Father, as Jesus said, you know, pray to your Father in, in heaven. Or he said, pray like this, our Father, my, uh, which art in heaven, my Father, which is, you're in heaven. And uh, one of the uh, Family Circus cartoons by Bill King had the, had the, the this the older daughter praying uh, I, as she's going to recite the Lord's Prayer. Says, "Our Father which art in heaven." Her little brother says, "No, our Father art down in the living room watching TV." There, there, there is a distinctiveness, and it, and and we look at our relationship to 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 God as our heavenly Father. And we look at the Word, and the Word's relationship is unique. He does, Christ does call God his Father. But in John 1, that, that his relationship is not one of a father-son relationship, that Christ was God eventually. And in, in Colossians 1.15, that was even before the creation of the world. We talk about in the beginning, uh, or in the beginning was the Word, the word, and the Word was God, uh, excuse me, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Remember, Logos, 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 okay. Here, this Logos, or Jesus Christ is who John was referring to, uh, this Logos, this Word, living Word, was was with God before the creation of the world. And and in terms of this word, Jesus, John points out that he is also divine. He was human, a person, and he and he died as a human being on a cross, tortured and left for dead hanging on the cross till he died. That was the harsh Roman government in action. And and so Christ was this human person, but Christ is also divine. That is, he was God. The Word was God. That means that he had the same nature and character and quality of being exactly as what we who we would who we would refer to as God the Father. And 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 it was through Christ that God created the world, even though we don't see it exactly like that in Genesis 1. It just says in the beginning, God created the heavens uh, and, the, and the earth. Uh, and when we, when we look at that, we, don't, we just see the word God. Later on in Genesis, you'll, you'll hear a phrase or read a phrase, where, and God said, let us make a man. The word God there is the Hebrew word Elohim. And that is a unique word as well because it is a plural word. And that's where the us came from. There are different theories about why that is. Uh, one theory is like kings sometimes would speak of, you know, we, we need, we're going to do this or we think this when it's actually the king. And that there was, I did read one comment some years ago that that might be it, but I always really just thought that it was actually, uh, when we look at that, uh, it, uh, there's the Holy Trinity, or the Trinity, which is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, I believe that's what the us referred to, that Christ was there uh, from the beginning. The Holy Spirit was there from the beginning. And, of course, God the Father was there from the beginning. And we find that the uh, earth was, was without, without form and void in Genesis. Uh, and that the 
Hebrew word there that's translated was, in my opinion, should be was. It should not be, became, as Brother Dake uh, in his comments and commentary and some others uh, think that. It can be translated became, but I believe that it should have been translated correctly as it is in the King James Version was, but that's my opinion. That's not scripture. Okay. Anybody got comments or suggestions? Okay, let's let's skip to the, some pages here and let's turn to page five, if you will. And we'll begin with this all over again. Was this more than you wanted to know about Lagos and some things like that? It may have been a little much. My uh, sympathy, people. Here we go. John 1, 1, 3. This is the verses and questions. And these verses and questions, uh, uh, let me see where they're from right quick. Give these people credit where it is. It is, uh, something study there, I don't, I'm not sure. Let me take, right on, it's underneath the very first page. Yeah, I don't just think we need to give credit for it. And also, if it's not right, you could have somebody to blame. From John Bible study. Okay, there you go. That was that was correct. I can see it nice and big. Bibleversusstudy.com is where the rest of this material kind of comes from. I take the time and effort to insert Bible verses. They only show you the question. And I'm trying to choose which Bible version I think would be better. So, uh, back to John chapter 1. Mm -hmm. Page. And this study guide that we prepared. Wow. Wonderful wife Brenda ran this afternoon. Okay. John chapter 1. We're going to be looking at a section of John chapter 1 verses 1 through 8. Bible study questions. Begin reading first in the Amplified Bible. All three verses. In the beginning, before all time, was the Word. And I inserted the word Christ in parentheses there. This is at the middle of page 5, kind of. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God himself. What was the Greek word for the word, word? Logos. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, in the beginning, before all time, was the Logos. And the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God himself. He was present originally with God. All things were made and came into existence through him. And without him was not even one thing made that has come into being or come into existence. So what five claims there are that we see there about the word? It was there in the beginning. That's right. It was there in the beginning. Yes. And it was God. It was God Himself too. He was God and He is God. That's he, right. He was originally with God. That's right. He was God. And He came into existence. He was with God. Yeah. Him. Mm -hmm. And without Him, there was nothing made. No things are existed through Him. Mm -hmm. Very good. And without Him, not even one thing made. Yes. And this is we're going to look at Genesis that we shared part of this. Now, this is the Amplified Bible. If you want to understand the Bible a little better. It's a lot of reading because it amplified means it kind of shows you some shades of Hebrew or Greek, so it's extra, but it's sometimes very well worth it. And this is Genesis 1, 1 through 3 in the Amplified Bible. In the beginning, God prepared, formed, fashioned, and created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and an end and empty waste, and darkness was upon the face of a very great deep. The Spirit of God was moving, that is, hovering or brooding, depending on the Bible translation you choose. Uh, all of those words are there, different versions. Over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. So we look at John chapter 1, all the different things that we just, you just shared. Uh, are they consistent? Is Genesis 1 sort of consistent with John 1? Yes, sir. Yes. 
They are. They're uh, very similar, and it is amazing that John would choose to introduce his gospel using this terminology. Okay? And in, in verse 3, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Now, Genesis 1, 6, this, so we, we see the creation here. We're going to look at the word firmament. It, it, in English, it doesn't sound like what it is. Y'all know what the firmament is? Sky. Sky is what it is. It's just that it's, I looked it up, it's translated from a, a, a Hebrew word or Latin word, I forget which it was. It's on the, on the next page, okay? It is sky. And, it, and it, it's like firmamento or something, mento, I'm, Somebody's laughing if they can speak Greek and understand the Greek language. Okay. And so in verse 6 of Genesis 1, God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. What did the creation look like at this point? With number one. At first. Then the sky, uh, that was on earth. Mm -hmm. But then when he spoke, it was the heavens. Okay, when you when you look at this picture of the earth as it as it was before any of this took place, uh, it was a waste area apparently only with water, uh, no no land and no sky. It was like just I'm assuming a soupy type mix, uh, perhaps, and maybe uh, at the, at the on where we call the earth, maybe where like more solid water might have been. But that's all there was. And and then the Lord said, let there be a sky or a firmament to divide them as Ronnie just said, okay? And, uh, and so we look at these accounts. We'll skip the rest of this. And, and when you look at this, this is all tied to John chapter 1. Let me ask, we'll skip to the bottom of page 8. When I was 20, friends and neighbors, I could see for a while. Okay. So at the bottom of, of page 8, is the Holy Spirit mentioned in Genesis 1? Yes. Yes, it was. In, in Genesis 1, we find that that God said, let there be light. I remember preaching a message on that, and, and in my process of preparing that message, there was something I found out that made an unforgettable impression on me, because I always just read it. I'm assuming that the light had come from the moon and the sun. But when I prepared that message, God said, let there be light, before he said, you know, he would set the moon and the sun uh, in the sky, basically. Before the sun and moon were created, God already created light. He does not need the sun nor the moon to provide light. As a matter of fact, in the book of Revelation in the New Jerusalem, the city there will need no light, and it will never be night because the, the Bible says that Jesus himself is, will be the light. Though I've often wondered exactly what kind of light that is. Is it a physical light or is it a spiritual type light? Uh, it might not be what we think of as light, but I, it, it well could be. Uh, John looked in the throne room and he could see God and, you know, all the different things that were part of it. But sometimes ones of God's children, I see the light in their face and that's the the Holy Spirit in them, and they're, they're lit up. Thank I've seen it in you in you faces. Thank you. Uh, that is the case, and that is the Spirit of the Lord. It does tend to uh, affect people's countenance, actually. Really, uh, uh, anointing makes people look better than they normally do, and they have more energy than they normally do, mm -hmm. uh, except when it leaves. But so much energy, <laughs> usually. You're very, you've got a few miles on it. 
Okay. In John 1, 5, the Bible says, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. What does the word comprehend mean there, comprehended? Different versions have, they translate that word different ways. It is a problem kind of word. I always thought when I looked at it in the context of the sentence that I'm just talking the the context of the sentence that it meant overcome that there there are different ways that's translated uh, did not overpower it could not comprehend it and, and so it's a word that's interesting but different people have translated it different ways it's not a uh, simple word apparently to translate. Ronnie? Okay. Uh, so here it is in the Amplified Bible to sort of give you that idea. And the light, this is, now in the King James Version, it is not capitalized light. In the Amplified Bible, it is. And the light shines on in the darkness, and the darkness has never overpowered it, or put it out, or absorbed it, or appropriated it, and I'm not sure what that meant, that, I don't know if I'd have put that there or not, there's a reason they put it there, and is unreceptive to it. So you have these different shades of meaning. Here is this, this word light, in, in, in John 1, it implies revelation that discloses the light that is in Christ. If you're going to, to understand or receive uh, the light that is in Christ, it will be through Christ. He is the light that gives us spiritual light, basically, with the help of the Holy Spirit, with the help of the Word of God. Uh, and sermons or, or lessons or songs, different, different. God uses different things. And this idea of a, from the Rowry Study Bible says this, that this word life here it denotes salvation and deliverance based on Christ's atonement or Christ's sacrifice on the cross for our sins. And in that study Bible, uh, Brother Ryrie Brother or whoever wrote it said this, that a better way of putting that was that the darkness did not overcome the light. And I tend personally, based on the context of the sentence in English, which you cannot always apply that, how it reads in English and how it reads in Greek or, or Hebrew or Chaldean or Aramaic, might not work when you translate it into English. But I think, in my opinion, I've always thought it was overcome. Well, so, you, you okay. can take a flashlight, walk outside in the dark, you can turn that light on, it comes takes care of the darkness, but the darkness can't take care of the light if you turn it off. That's right. The darkness cannot put out the light. The light overcomes the darkness. With a, as Marcus uh, said uh, correctly, with a, a flashlight. And oddly enough, if you have a, the darker it is, the better the flashlight actually works. Mm -hmm. And even if it's very dark, you can take even a flashlight with dim batteries and it will still light up. Uh, space. Comments or suggestions? But could the darkness, what they were trying to get out, was talking about the people that was in the earth and when Jesus came they couldn't comprehend him, comprehend him because of who he was and because they were walking in darkness in the devil and they couldn't comprehend the light because it was they wasn't in the light. That's right. The Bible says a different way the God of this world has blinded they, they're blinded by the God of this world, Satan. So, anybody else got comments or suggestions? That's right. Okay. Now, so, the next question that Ronnie just kind of helped us deal with is, what is this darkness? When it refers to that, that the light shines in the darkness, what does that mean? There's no light. It means the world and the evilness of the world. That's right. Spiritual darkness. Now in John chapter 1 verse 6, we now we move from the creation account 
that centered in Genesis to uh, the introduction of Jesus in, in John 1 6. Okay. Okay, yeah. Uh, in John 1 6, King James Version, the Bible says there, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And so, is the writer there, is this where it says this, there was a man sent, sent from John, is that who is writing this gospel that we read? No, no because it goes on to say in the next verse that that man was a witness, so um, it was John the Baptist that was came to be a witness. It wasn't the writer of John. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in John chapter 1, verse 7, Amplified Bible, this man came to witness that he might testify of the light and that all men might believe it, believe in it. Can we read these next phrases together? This is the Amplified, Amplified Bible giving a definition to in, in terms of the, the people who translated the Amplified Bible. Uh, this is given an explanation of what it means to believe in. Okay. That all men might believe in, and it is adhere to it, trust in it, and rely on it. Adhere to, trust in, rely on it. That's what it means to actually uh, believe in, in, in Christ. It means that you adhere to him, you trust in him, and you rely on him. Not your own self, not on other people, not your own righteousness, not your good deeds, which are important. God expects us to do the right thing and do good deeds. Uh, but uh, we are saved because we put our trust and our faith in Jesus Christ that the, uh, knowing that he died for our sins. Okay? And then, so what role was John, this John the, the, from the wilderness here, what, did he, what was he sent to perform? To witness. That's right. About the light. That's right. Uh, and that could be referring to the Old Testament system where you needed uh, two witnesses. And of course, one would be John the Baptist and one would be Jesus Christ himself. Or we actually, God speaks from heaven and we see the Holy Spirit in one place coming down on, uh, and remaining on Christ. Okay, and who or what was the light? Jesus. Jesus, that's right. Now we look at the second section, which is John chapter 1, verses uh, 9 through 13. John 1, 9, Amplified Bible. There it was. The true light was then coming into the world, the genuine, perfect, steadfast light that illuminates every person. Now, illuminates every person. So who was... Who is the true light here? Jesus. Jesus. That's right. Uh, and and so and where is this true light? In heaven with God. Okay. Very good. John chapter one verse one, King James Version. He came to his own. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. His own. What is his own? His family, the Jewish people, and Jewish people. That y'all are all did good on that. Actually, this word can refer to all of those things, and we will find out that it might just do that in the Amplified Bible. Uh, came into his own world that he created. Came on to came to his own people. He was a Jew, uh, sent from God. Uh, and possibly even his family didn't believe in him. I think Mary would always have believed in him and Joseph. I'm not sure about the brothers and sisters, though later on, one of his brothers, James, became a great leader in the early church, and we read the book that is entitled by his name, uh, the Epistle of James. And Jude, the book of Jude, was one of his brothers. Jude was Actually, one of his brothers. If you read Jude, it's one chapter long. This is John uh, 
1, 11, and first the Amplified Bible, then the New Living Translation, then the Passion New Translation. Uh, and so, just to see you look at all of this. He came to that which belonged to him, and in brackets, to his own, his domain, creation, things, world. That is, he came to his own domain. He came to his own creation. He came to his own things. He came to his own world. And they that were his own did not receive him and did not welcome him. This is John, this is New Living Translation. He came to his own people, as I think Ronnie said, and even they rejected him. And Passion New Translation. He came to the very people he created, to those who should have recognized him, but they did not receive him. And when we talk about walking with the Lord, understanding salvation. In John 1.13, these are people there which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So we see here four different wills. First of all, they were, well, they're of the blood. It's not, it's really not. There's three wills, and here's not not of blood, nor not is not of a human being, uh, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So what does the blood here refer to? Which were born not of blood. Oh, given birth. Like, uh, the blood line? Mm -hmm. He's talking about people being born from a natural. Physically. Yes. Uh, talks, uh, this is referring to... These people who are God's people, uh, they were born not as human. They're not, we were all, they were born humans. But actually, when you talk about being God's people, they are born of the will of God. And in and, and John 1, 13, they did not become his children. This is New Century Version. They did not become his children in any human way, that is, by human parents or by or human desire, like most, everybody is probably born human beings. They were born of God. So we talked about the will of the flesh and the will of man, and that's just human nature and the process there. Uh, well, who can become the children of God? Anyone that thinks Jesus. That's right. Whoso it's John three sixteen for whosoever believeth in him that is in Christ will not perish but have everlasting life. Okay, and it is right now almost eight o'clock. Uh, okay, we'll keep going then. John one fourteen. This is the this is a wonderful verse in John chapter one. Always one of my favorite verses. It's, it's the Christmas verse that's not exactly Christmas. The Bible says in John 1, 14, and the Word, you remember in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the, and the Word was God, and the Word, oh, excuse me, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Here it is, the same Word. Using, and the Word, Logos, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So what happened to the word that we read about in, in John 1.1? 1, 1, uh, what happened to that word when we look at John 1.14? He, he was made flesh. Okay. Became a, like a human being. Uh, and when it talks about here, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, uh, some people think that refers to what we call the Mount Transfiguration event where, where Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, takes them up into a high mountain, and the Bible says in the King James Version, Jesus was transfigured before them. Apparently he had an appearance much like he did when, he, when Christ appeared to the Apostle Paul after the resurrection of Christ on the road to Damascus in, in Acts chapter 9. So uh, the word 
that started out in the beginning with God and was God and was with God, this same word became a human being, basically. Uh, he was human, but he was also God. In, in the New Living Translation, it's, word, it's like this. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. The King James Version uses the phrase, the only begotten Son. That is, everyone else except Christ, who was a child of God, was adopted or engrafted, uh, in the words of the Apostle Paul, into the family of God. Christ uh, never had to be uh, adopted or engrafted into the family of God because he was always uh, mm -hmm. there in the beginning. Okay? And so, and, and, and so, anybody else want to comment on what the phrase only son means there? I think you can share it. Yeah. There is no other individual ever born uh, or even created by God, as such as angels and other things, uh, none of them are in the same class that Jesus is. Uh, Jesus is a unique person. Uh, and and uh, as we were talking in a Sunday school class here one time, and this subject came up about Christ. And I mentioned that I had read a definition of Christ of how you would describe Christ. And it was other. That is, he was other than we are. He is other than the way we think. He is other in all of the things that he does. He's not like we are. And that's what it says in Isaiah 55, God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Okay. And in John 1, verses 15 and 16, the New Living Translation, John testified about him when he shouted to the crowds. In Pentecostal circles, that'd be called, an, he was anointed to preach. He put it out there where they could hear it, didn't have a sound system, but was our music as far as we know, and he was extremely successful. Uh, cost him his life, but he was extremely successful. Okay, he's, this is what he shouted to the crowds. This is the one I was talking about when I said someone is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. From his abundance, we have all received one gracious blessing uh, after another. So, which John was it here that was shouting out? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Very good. And how long was Jesus before John? He was always. Okay. And and that when John said he's greater than I am, I think we all know that John and Jesus were cousins. And actually, John was six months older than Jesus. Uh, and he had, a, he had a miracle birth uh, from Zechariah and Elizabeth. They were up in age, could not have children, and then they had a child, this, this son named John. And I have read that John was a member of this sect in the desert called Essenes, E-S-S-E-N-E-S. And one of the things that they they pre preached and practiced, they baptized people in water for the forgiveness of sins. So when you see John doing that, uh, he's just doing what he had been taught and what they did. He was also a priest. And he was also a priest, that's right. He, 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 the, the, Daddy. Oh yeah, Zechariah was a high priest actually. Uh, when he got the news that he was going to have a son. He was in the Holy of Holies. That's right. And, uh, and I think Zechariah had problems believing it. And the angel said, you don't be able to say anything until born. after he's born. And when, when John was born, I think they were all trying to say, well, his name's going to be Zechariah Jr. They kept saying, said, no, it's not. And then finally he wrote his name as John, which is what he was told to name John. 
and then he could speak again. In his mouth, that's right. So it was quite. You can read. You read stuff in the Bible. It's interesting. It's adventures and everything. It's, it's interesting. Very good. John one seventeen. And while the law was given through Moses, that is what we refer to as the Mosaic law. This was a system that God handed down through Moses to the nation of Israel or the, or the Jewish people and it was a system of how to approach God in worship. They could not approach God just any time. They had to first present an offering for their sins uh, and also there were different types of offerings uh, but it was often or usually a sacrifice of an animal. It was not their choice of what to give. They had to give the very best that they had. And they did not come to God without an offering. Okay. Any comments or suggestions? Okay. Uh, so what is what law is this specifically re referring to? Ten Commandments. Okay. Ten Commandments. It, it refers to the this of Ten Commandments and all the law and prophets basically are they hang or build on that. Uh, it is the law given through Moses, what we refer to as the Mosaic law of how to worship God, how to approach God, and the difference between what we how we worship God and they worship God's night and day. We don't offer animal sacrifices anymore because Christ fulfilled the law by living a perfect sinless life. And he was always going to the Messiah was always going to come and die for the sins of the world. And the graphic description of that is in Isaiah 53. This is the, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, uh, Study Bible. And it says this there, The contrast between the law and grace and truth is not that the law was bad and that, that Jesus was good. Rather, the giving of the law and the coming of Jesus mark stages in God's reaching out to humanity. Jesus, however, marks the final definitive revelation of God's grace and truth. He is actually superior to Abraham, and Abraham's called the father of our faith. And when, uh, when, a, when a guy named Lazarus died a beggar, we see Abraham's name there. There was a place called Abraham's bosom. Some people think refers to paradise, and others don't. Uh, but anyway... Uh, so there is a contrast, and, and basically this is God's uh, greater and greater revelation of himself up until the time that we are in the new Jerusalem, and God then is our people, and he is our God, and we live there in that city. Uh, okay, and, and so we look at, God reaching out to people. Now, in John 1.18, this is good. We may do this one and we'll come to a, to a stop. The Bible says, makes this interesting statement that I, I've always wondered about and still kind of do. But in John 1.18, this is the King James Version. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So, what does that mean, anybody? Nobody has seen the glory of God. Okay. Nobody but Jesus. I don't think you can take it. They've seen his backside. <laughs> but Moses has seen his backside. That's but right. But he wasn't the glory of God. That's right. But there have been other accounts where people said, we have seen the face of God and we're not consumed, I think. No. Okay, it may not be. I was thinking, uh, it, it's interesting. Different opinions about that. Here's, here's, and that's good. That's not bad. John one eighteen, New Living Translation. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son is Himself God, and is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. So we have that expression there. The the only. Son, the only begotten Son in the King James Version. And what does that mean? 
that he is the only son. That's right. They're going to be another one. That's it. Uh, yeah, they are. Everybody, every, all of our children of God are adopted. Uh, okay. And so we look at, no one has ever seen God. Now this is, an, if you'd like to have an interesting study Bible, it's D-A-K-E, Day Annotated Study Bible. And I have, I have one, and I have them in my Bible programs on my computer as well. This is interesting, and this is what Brother Dake says. Like our English, seen, S-E-E-N, means to see with our eyes, and also see with our mind. That is, that it means here to comprehend fully or understand it's clear from the fact that many people have seen, many men have seen God, and here are all these references, you can look them up. This Genesis 18, uh, verses 2, 30, and 33. Genesis 32, 24 through 30, and it goes on and on. And finally, Daniel, there's a bunch of, uh, of references. Finally, Daniel chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. I did not look up those references. And then Brother Dake goes on to say this, this verse, the verse could read, no man has ever comprehended or experienced God at any time in all his fullness, save or accept the only begotten Son. He, that is Jesus, the only begotten Son, hath declared him, that is God the Father, that Christ is the first to experience God in the fullness of the Holy Spirit is, is clear from like, these references beginning with John 3.34 ending with Luke 4.16-18 where the Spirit of the Lord is upon Christ. He's quoting Isaiah 62 1 and 2 there. Alright. This is John 1, 1 through 3 and again in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him and without Him was not anything made that was made. So uh when you look at who who God is, uh, and we we see we see God in His uniqueness. No man has seen God at any time. Got any comments or questions or suggestions? Okay. We'll we'll do one more and then we will stop. This is the uh, another section of questions from John one. In John 1, 19, this is the New International Version. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. Again, who was this John? John the Baptist. It was John the Baptist. He didn't, I don't think he went to the temple. I think they came out there to the river, Jordan River, I believe. And, uh, and why is John... Uh, uh, identified by that label, John the Baptizer, I think. Because he would baptize people. That's he right. Be baptized. That's what he. By water. That's right. That's what he was teaching. That's right. And also in the Greek, there the word baptize is translated from the Greek word baptismo. It means two things, or it can mean two things. One is to immerse completely in water. That's what. We do in the Church of God, many other uh, groups of uh, Christians do that too. The other uh, thing that it can mean is to, uh, to, to pour water over somebody. Uh, I have always thought that it, the correct understanding was totally put into the water because that's what Jesus did when he came up out of the water, the Bible says. Now... In John 1, 21, New King James Version, they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Why do they ask him if he is Elijah or the prophet? Because they're trying to find out who he is. They don't know who he is. They couldn't be understand who he was. That's right. But he comes preaching and with this fiery word from the Lord. Uh, and uh, and these people, uh, I would think, see the symbolism between Elijah and John the Baptist, particularly with a very harsh, demanding, 
uh, anointed message that would pierce people's hearts to the core. Deuteronomy 18.15 This is where the, where the word prophet comes from. The Lord thy God will raise unto thee a prophet, capital P, from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. So who is this prophet like me? John the Baptist, or is that he, he, or John the one that made it? It's Jesus. I believe it, yeah, but I believe it was Jesus, and John was the one like Elijah. I believe it before Christ, was, or, or later, before the end of time, that Elijah will come back to earth and be one of the two witnesses, if you read about it in the book of Revelation. Okay. And in John 1, 23, this is King James Version. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. The odd phrase there to me was always, make straight the way of the Lord. What does that mean? You always live for God and do what is right. That's good. Uh, this idea of, of making straight the way of the Lord or making a plain path for the Lord dealt with the way that they would, when kings would travel overland, there would be uh, people I have read that my team that would go before the king, if it was holes in the road, they would kind of smooth it out and, and level out the road. And that's kind of what they, the idea was behind this is what I have read. Now in the Passion New Translation, it's a little easier to understand, the Bible says there, so John answered them, I am fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy. I am an urgent, thundering voice shouting in the desert. Clear the way and prepare your heart for the coming of the Lord Yahweh. Uh, that's probably the best rendering of that that I have read ever. And straight, make straight the way of the Lord and the King James Version, Passion New Translation, clear the way and prepare your heart for the coming of the Lord Yahweh. And that will be, again, the message of Elijah, who is currently in heaven. He never died. He was called away in what the Bible called a chariot of fire. So, uh, and we'll just, we can stop right there, I think. God bless y'all for being here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Word of God, which is the will of God. Help us to understand the Word of God better. And we thank you, Lord, for a, a, just a, a lot of insight. I, I think it's important. If we really want to understand, John, these are some things we need to understand uh, about this book. Thank you for all the questions and comments. Thank you for these people who put this study, uh, at least the questions, together, uh, as well as other people that we look to for sources. Uh, preparing this, and we thank you for your grace toward us all, in Jesus' name, amen. Can we give the Lord praise? <laughs> oh, yeah. This is CCOG Online, I'm Pastor Dwayne Atkinson, really glad you joined us, it's a ministry of Cairo Church of God in Cairo, Georgia, we are here Sundays at 11 a.m., Sundays at 6 p.m., and Wednesdays at 7 p.m., hope you'll join us for all of those. Have a blessed rest of the week.